Okay, either way, I'm going to start with Scripture from uh, Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Start in verse 7. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him. Now this was John the Baptist. John the Baptist was down baptizing folks in the Jordan River. And this is a story about some people coming out to see John the Baptist. So when he began to saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Our message today is going to be entitled, How Do We Bear Good Fruit? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, Lord. We humble our hearts. We do ask you to forgive our many transgressions, Father. We ask you to help us not be transgressors of you or of your people. Lord, we thank you for the bountiful blessings you bestowed upon us. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for letting us come together to study your word and praise your name. Father, we ask you to send your spirit to give us eyes to see and ears to hear the things that we need to know from your word. Father, show us how to bear good fruit. And we thank you and we praise you in the name above every name, that is Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> okay. How important is it to bear good fruit? Sounds pretty important if you hear what John said. He said the axe was already laid at the root of the trees. And if they don't bear good fruit, they are going to be cut down and thrown in the fire. That sounds pretty serious to me. Now what was John talking about? And this next statement applies even to our, a lot of our Israelite identity brethren who they believe that salvation is by race. And it also applies to our Judeo-Christian brethren who believe that those people over there in the Middle East get salvation by race. Nobody gets salvation by race. Those people <laughs> that know who the Israelites are think that they're saved by, the, by that fact. And the people who think, well, there's people over in the Middle East and there's probably more of them in New York and Hollywood and Washington, D.C., in your banks and all that stuff and running your governments. But they're not saved by their race either. There is no racial salvation. True salvation is only available through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross of Calvary. No matter who you are or from who you have descended, the only way into God's eternal kingdom is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's it. You cannot enter his kingdom unless you have been cleansed by the blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins. Now, the proof positive that you have been washed in that cleansing fount is the fruit of of your repentance. There will be good fruit present in your life if you have truly repented. How did John explain it? He told them to bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. So early on, this was the kingdom message before Jesus even came on the scene preaching. The message was the message of the kingdom and John told them to bear fruit. He said the fruit would be the evidence of their repentance. Well, what would that involve? What does it mean to repent? Thayer's Greek lexicon gives this definition here. This is one of them. gives several, but here's one. It says, especially the change of mind of those who have begun to abhor their errors and misdeeds and have determined to enter upon a better course of life so that it embraces both a recognition of sin and sorrow for it and hearty amendment, the tokens and effects of which are good deeds. So repentance is being sorry, changing your mind, changing your behavior, and performing good deeds. Fruits are definitely related to abhorring your sins also. It says you're going to turn away from your sin, you're going to start a new lifestyle, and you're going to do good deeds. 
Thayer said hardy a minute. Hardy. What do you think of when you think of hardy? Coming from the heart is what it actually means. It has to do with actions that come from your heart. And we read this in Deuteronomy 6, 5 because God's always been, the whole story is what we do from our heart. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And it says, <clears throat> when we get there, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. How does that relate to what John was teaching? Well, what would you repent of other than violation of God's law? And this is telling you that you've got to have God's law in your heart. Therefore, if you are bearing good fruit, would you be loving God with all your heart? Yes, you would. And what would be the evidence of that love? Evidence that you love God is that you keep his law. How do we know that? Because what Jesus said in John chapter 14. John said this in chapter 14. The words of Jesus quoted here. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said. I didn't make it up. I just read it out of your Bible. So, said you would keep the commandments. You would have them in your heart. What else would you do? You would teach them to your children and you'd teach your children to obey them. Would you not? Well, you can sum up the fruit of repentance in one simple word. Obedience. Yes, the only fruit we can bear is our obedience to God's word. Now since that is true, how easy is it to judge the fruit that we bear? It's not hard if you read this word. It can only be evaluated by the perfect standard of God's word. Therefore, if we will simply read and understand the word of God, then there will be absolutely no question whether we are bearing good or bad fruit. And remember what Jesus said about that. We read it, I think we read this last week, but we're going to read it again this week. Matthew 7 said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by what? By their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. I think we talked about that last week in regard to some people that everybody thinks are good trees, but they just got a little bit of bad fruit. Well, no, it's not the way it is. Because Jesus said this, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So not only if you bear bad fruit, if you bear no fruit, if you don't bear good fruit, you're going to be cut down. So you, if you're one of these fruitless Christians, you might ought to rethink that. And Jesus said finally, so then you will know them by their fruits. Now, Jesus explained that we have to judge the fruit. And we're exhorted throughout Scripture to bear good fruit. However, the first fruit we have to judge is our own. We've talked about judging a little bit last week, maybe week before last too, and, and you know, all the verses people like to use, you know, judge not lest you be judged and all that, and people don't want us to judge them. Well, in the Bible reading this week that I was doing, I came across another verse, which is actually a continuation from that, 
it's in Matthew chapter 7, where it says, Judge not lest you be judged, and it goes on to tell about looking at the beam in your brother's eye. Uh, and people use this to say, oh, see there, you can't judge me. Jesus said, don't judge anybody. Let's read that scripture and analyze exactly what it really says. See what it really says. Matthew 7, starting in verse 3. It says, Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how could you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, what did he say there? Did Jesus command that you're not supposed to see a speck in your brother's eye? No, he did not. What did he say? The order was to get your eye cleaned out so that you can clearly see the speck in your brother's eye. In other words, but you've got to judge your brother by the same standard that you judge yourself. That was the problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They made up all these traditions and they held people up to these ridiculous standards and they even placed their traditions above the Word of God. Their traditions were a great big log in their eye and they would accuse people of the tiniest little infraction of their law like they accused Jesus of, well, your disciples eat with unwashed hands because they didn't do this ceremonial washing. That ceremonial washing was never commanded in Scripture. So they had this log in their eye that they were not fulfilling the actual commandments of God, but then they wanted to see a splinter in the disciples because they, they didn't wash their hands in a certain manner. So... That's why Jesus called them hypocrites. And we have to be extremely careful not to get ourselves into the category of hypocrites. It's a pretty easy thing to do when we start trying to be too much of a legalist. You know, yes, we do need to obey the law, but more importantly, it's got to be in our hearts. We have to strive to obey the letter and the spirit of the law. Jesus spent a good bit of his ministry trying to explain that's how it worked. It's not a new concept. It's been spelled out all the way through the Bible. God has wanted obedience from the heart, not from a legal standpoint. I mean, yes, we do need to obey the letter of the law, but it's not what's, you know, uh, some laws have been broken, just like what did Jesus talk about? <laughs> what did he tell the Pharisees when he's talking to them about David that went in and ate the showbread in the temple? Well, that was against the law, but him and his men were hungry. Was he going to let his men starve and not eat that showbread? No, he went in and took it. Yeah, he broke the law, but he fulfilled the law of love by feeding his men that were fighting with him. So, <laughs> who was right and who was wrong, you know. All right, let's look, at, uh, let's look at these. We'll confirm that Jesus, uh, the Old Testament con agrees with Jesus about needing to fulfill the spirit of law and obey in love. Let's look at first, we'll go to Proverbs 21. It says every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. To do righteousness and justice is desired by the Lord more than sacrifice. Now look at Deuteronomy 10. The Lord says again, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to walk in the fear of the Lord and to walk in all his ways and to love him? And to serve the Lord, your God, with all your heart and all your soul. And to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today, for your good. He gave them the law for their own good. If we keep the law, it will be good. Now look at Micah, and we'll finish this little section out. Micah chapter 6. It says, What with shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? 
but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Pretty simple. Or it seems that way. Well, we know the wages of sin is death. We know that sin is the transgression of God's law. We know that whenever sin is committed, something or someone has to die. Blood has to be shed to, to atone for sin against a holy God. That's the letter of the law. But God said, we just read it, God said he does not want the sacrifice. That's not what he wants. He wants the obedience from your heart. He wants love, kindness, justice, righteousness, humility. What are all these things? How do we get these things? That's what he was looking for way back in the Old Testament. And then Paul talked about it in the New Testament. Look what he wrote to the Galatians in chapter 5. Paul wrote this in the book of Galatians. Starting in chapter 5 and verse 22. He tells us the same thing that God talked about right there that we just read. But the fruit of the Spirit, ah, fruit of what? The Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So there's all that good fruit spelled out by Paul and it seems just like what we read from Moses and Solomon and Micah. Does it not? Don't it all sound about like the same thing? He wants it from your heart. Rightly did Solomon say there is no new thing under the sun. Our God still wants the same thing from his people today that he wanted back the day he first created them. He never changes. He has always desired for us to produce good fruit. Why do you suppose that is? Well, maybe it's because he formed Adam from the dust of the ground in his own image and likeness and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God placed his spirit into the man that he formed out of the dust. And it says Adam became a living soul. So who was Adam? According to scripture, Adam was the son of God. The genealogy of Joseph, who was married to Jesus' mother, Mary, is listed in Luke chapter 3. And the last verse in the book of Luke chapter 3 says this. It's given the genealogy all the way back. It says, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Okay. Now, if Adam is counted as a son of God, if he was formed in the image and likeness of God. Do you suppose that God himself might want or even expect Adam to be and to act like God himself? He made him in it. He, I mean, it's, that's his son. I mean, do most men not want their son to be like them? Well, how much better is our father in heaven? Uh, would he, you think he would want him to possess most, if not all, of his great attributes? Being a perfect father, he would, he would want and expect nothing less. Therefore, would God expect anything less from Adam's descendants? Would he expect the descendants of Adam to do the same thing? Surely not. I believe if we correctly understand Scripture, this is a primary theme all the way through the Bible. God wants his children to have his heart and mind within themselves. In fact... That's exactly what the new covenant is all about. I know people discuss this quite frequently and they mainly focus on who the covenant is made with. And I agree we need to understand who the covenant is with. There is no doubt. It's only made with one group of people. And it's very important. <clears throat> and I think it needs to be clearly understood but people never analyze the actual legal substance of the covenant. We focus a lot on, on who and what, who it's about and who it's for. But, and I'll emphasize this, I agree, the, the covenant's found, the description of the new covenant is found in Jeremiah 31, 31, and in Hebrews 8. We're going to read Hebrews 8. And we're going to look at this. And the first two verses definitely tell us who the covenant's with. And there is no mistake. It's, and it's not spiritualized or anything else. It's a literal statement. 
Hebrews 8, verse 8 says, For finding fault with them. They're speaking of God. Finding fault with who? With Israel. For finding fault with them, he says, God says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant and I did not care for them, says the Lord. Now, no doubt, who did he take by the hand and lead out of Egypt? The Israelites. This was not, he's, he's not speaking to anybody else. But the next verse to me is most critical. And a lot of people, I think, just kind of gloss over it and don't think about what it actually says. Let's read it and then we'll talk about it. He says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. And what did he say? I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, that is the completion of what he, the purpose that he started when he formed Adam. Put in him the breath of life and he gave him his spirit and that's what he wanted within Adam. Now we know that Adam fell because of the sin in the garden. And that all of Adam's descendants have been born under the bondage of sin. We know that Jesus Christ is the second Adam. God Almighty who came among the descendants of Adam in a flesh tabernacle to deliver his people from their sins. He accomplished that by making the new covenant in his own blood to free his people from their sins. He sealed the new covenant with his blood when he died on the cross. And exactly what is the new covenant? What does it mean? What's the legal terminology in the covenant? The writer of Hebrews quoted Jeremiah saying in verse 10, This is the covenant that I will make. After those days, says the Lord. And he said what? He said, I will put my laws into their minds. And I will write them on their hearts. That is the covenant. The writing of the law. The putting in the heart. The, the putting in their mind and the putting in their heart of the law. How is the covenant made? The, the law written in its place. But now we've got another problem. Because our modern Christian churches say that God's law has been eliminated. There is no law. It's been nailed to the cross and crucified. They say we're, the law is gone and we're under grace. Well, guess what? If they're correct, there is no new covenant. Because the new covenant is the law being put in your heart and in your mind. You know, the sad, sad thing about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had half of this covenant right. They had half of it right. Seriously. Look at, look at Mark, what Jesus said to them. I mean, they were, they were so close, you know. They were so close. What Jesus said to them. And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips. But what? Their heart is far away from me. Well, they actually did have a whole bunch of law in their minds, but they didn't have it in their hearts. They knew the law. They were legalists. I mean, they were lawyers. But they didn't have it in their hearts. And that's what made them hypocrites. But what's the result of having the law in both places, in your mind and in your heart? When you get it in your mind and your heart together, this is what God says will happen. He finished that verse saying, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah. It's really just that simple. If you're a new covenant Christian, you have got God's law in your mind and in your heart. Conversely, if you don't have God's law in your heart and mind, you have no part in the new covenant. 
The only way for anybody to determine if they have the law in their heart is by the fruit that they bear. The law is the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the living Word. Jesus Christ went to be back with the Father and He sent His Spirit to the people. That Spirit has to be in us. Now how do we get that Spirit within us? What did Peter tell us in the book of Acts? Chapter 2. Everybody's heard this one too. But we'll read it again. Peter said to them, Repent each of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. So, Now, if you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, what is that going to do? We read earlier where Paul explained the fruits of what? The fruits of the Spirit. In the same passage, he also had given the, the fruits or the works of the flesh. Fruits and works can be considered the same when you're talking about people. Now, here's what Paul listed as what we can refer to as bad fruit. He clearly tells us to pursue works or fruits of the Spirit and to stay away from these works of the flesh. So, we know we have to be in the Spirit to bear good fruit, and here's what we have to avoid so we don't bear bad fruit. <clears throat> Paul said this, Galatians 5, 16, But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are, here's your deeds, here's your bad fruit, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we can see the contrast between the good and bad fruit. And we know the source of both good and bad fruit. The flesh can only produce bad fruit because since the fall of Adam, all flesh is inherently corrupt. Despite all the modern teaching and the, and the psychoanalysis that tells us, oh, you just have to learn to find the good in everyone. Let me assure you, there is absolutely no good whatsoever in any human being unless it is in them by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. That's the only good in any of us, I promise you. There's nothing good in me other than His Spirit. How can you tell if the Spirit is there? Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. Well, when we start out judging fruits, the first and foremost place we need to look is in the mirror. If we can't find any fruits there, we need not go look anywhere else because he said first you've got to get that log out of your eye before you go checking your neighbor. There's no need for us to march into Washington, D.C. and try to straighten them out until we straighten out our lives personally, our families, our communities, our churches, or whatever you want to call it. So in closing, how do we bear that fruit? Well, we know if we live strictly in the flesh, we're, in the flesh, we're guaranteed to bear bad fruit and what happens if you bear bad fruit or even if you bear no fruit John said you're going to be cut down and cast in the fire that's not a good end so what's our option Paul told us we need to crucify the flesh and we have to have the spirit of God within us to produce good fruit Peter told us how to get that spirit into us he said be baptized and we'll receive the spirit and what does the Spirit bring us? 
Well, one thing Jesus had told the disciples that the Spirit of God would lead them into all truth. So when that Spirit brings the truth of God's law word into our mind and we have that law in our mind and in our hearts, then we have come under the new covenant. Once we have that Spirit in us, the law in our hearts, the law in our minds, and we've crucified our flesh, the obedience and the good works of the Spirit will be predominantly what comes out of us. That's not to say we're not going to make mistakes. We will, we will fall short and we will make mistakes. Surely we will because we're human. As long as we're flesh, we're never going to be perfect. We'll never obey perfectly. But the beautiful part of that is we have the blessed assurance that as soon as we repent, He is faithful to forgive us. And I'm going to say this about the fruit. I probably sound like a broken record, but us bearing fruit is what's going to bring about the harvest in the end of time. Jesus said in Mark 4, the man planted and he's waiting to see what he planted bear fruit before he can start to harvest. And when as soon as it's ready, he puts in the sickle. That's not happening until he sees fruit from what he planted. He planted Israel. The other part of that is the bride. He says the bride makes herself ready by getting this white linen and he says the white linen is righteous acts. That's fruit. So if we don't bear good fruit, there's going to be no harvest and there's going to be no wedding. Amen? So let's, uh, let's think on that this next week and try to figure out how to start bearing fruit, good fruit, and get rid of the bad. Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us come together today and study your word. Lord, we ask that you help us take your words into our heart and into our minds, keep them there, act on them, and bring forth good fruit, Father, so that we can look forward to that harvest and that wedding coming sooner and sooner all the time. We pray for that day to come, Lord, and cannot wait to see it. And we thank you and we praise you for all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.